for money, the idea of ownership becomes irrelevant. It is a shared system. In this model, the city complex, or in fact, the entire world, is really your home. If you require an automobile for whatever reason, the car is made available to you. When you get to your destination, the satellite-based driving system, which we do have today, we can drive cars with satellite. The car will automatically be made available to you and then made available to others after you're finished. As opposed to sitting in some parking lot for likely 80% of the life of the automobile. This is what we do. We waste so many resources and so much space with this primitive concept of personal ownership. To put it into a phrase, the resources of the planet become common heritage to all the world's people. It's important to point out, as we've previously denoted, that in society today, the need for property results in extreme product overlap, planned obsolescence, and redundant waste. There are many people today that criticize what we talk about without giving any reference to how sick the current establishment really is. It is much more intelligent, much more logical, and utterly much more responsible and practical to create a universal shared system for it would dramatically reduce waste, redundancy, and increase efficiency in space exponentially compared to what we are doing today. And this leads us to our final section, part four, the transition. Unfortunately, regardless of how well-reasoned, clear and obvious any new idea may be, the public today still maintains, on average, a tremendous fear of any form of social change. This is largely due to the propaganda and indoctrination which has been pushed upon them by the various establishment powers, which, of course, prefer to maintain their power. In fact, it really isn't the technical understandings and implementation of the physical attributes that comprise a resource-based economy which is the problem. What we're describing is nothing more than the practical application of known methods. And even if we couldn't do certain things right now, it's the reasoning that's important. It's the methodology we should be using that I hope everyone here thoroughly understands. The problem, in fact, is the opposing cultural values of society. That is what stands in the way. The ingrained patterns and uninformed nature of the conditioned culture. This is the most difficult aspect to consider when we talk about moving from point A to point B. And this is where the Zeitgeist Movement, an organization I work with, comes in. We are the activist communication arm of the Venus Project. We are here to spread statistical information and socially positive value identifications in the hope of bringing people into an awareness of the incredibly positive possibilities the future can hold. Once these understandings are fully realized, I, I really believe that most people will never be able to look at the world today in the same way. And the problems we find as commonplace today will become simply unacceptable, motivating change. I would like to quickly point out that the term zeitgeist is defined as the general intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of an era. The term movement very simply implies motion or change. Therefore, the zeitgeist movement is thus an organization which urges change in the dominant intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of the time, specifically to values and practices which would better serve the well-being of the whole of humanity, regardless of race, religion, creed, or any other form of contrived social status. We are again, in effect, the educational and activist arm of Jacques Fresco's Venus Project, working to unify the world in this common direction. To date, we have about 360,000 members operating in about 100 regional chapters over about 200 countries, which is pretty good considering the movement's only been around for about nine or 10 months. Our central role, gesturally speaking, is engaging in what I would call social therapy. The little discussed reality is that human beings are subject to social conditioning in a powerful way. And if we had the type of society we just described tomorrow, most people would be left confused and disillusioned. It would be like taking a native from the Amazon jungle and dropping them into New York City without any education whatsoever. Their behavior would be based on values which have no relevance in this new environment. In fact, and I know this might sound like a bold statement, but ethics, morality, and values are only as relevant 
as the social environment's propensity to support them or not. The Zeitgeist Movement has various projects in the works. We are working to educate people and hopefully bring them into a new perspective. We have teams and chapters, radio shows, films, PDFs, and annual events to promote this direction. We also do not take any general donations and provide all of our educational materials for free to the public. We are decentralized and work holographically through regional chapter teams and project teams. We have no offices, we have no leaders, I'm not a leader, I'm here as a communicator, and I try to work equally with everyone else. In fact, I would say that we are the initiators of what we call the transition. I believe Mohandas Gandhi had it correct. We must become the change we want to see in the world. Now, the transition itself from our current system into a resource-based economy is a very complex thing to consider. Of course, I get asked this all the time, which is why I'm bringing this up. And unfortunately, the variables are beyond our current foresight. The central issue, however, is awareness. If the public's consciousness can be expanded to understand and accept the incredible potential the future can hold, where poverty, war, 95% of all crime, along with the mundane, repetitive, meaningless jobs, can be eliminated, then I feel that they will be much more likely to adjust their values accordingly. And while there are many variations of outcomes and progressions that might occur as we move from our current system to the next, I will now attempt to summarize a probable path as I see it. The nature of industry to maximize profit by reducing input and labor costs shows a high propensity for the mechanization of labor. Since the Great Depression, this has been the case. The only reason technological unemployment hasn't consistently risen universally in the long term is because technology has also facilitated the introduction of new employment sectors with an adjustment period in between for laborers. In fact, uh, the Great Depression, uh, which was triggered by a lot of things, was also an adjustment period to mechanization. There were new skills that were learned by people that were unemployed as they adapted to the rapid increase uh, to mechanization during that period of time. However, the rate of increase for technological development seems to pair up with Moore's Law, if you are familiar. And that has to do with the exponential expansion of the capacity and size of technology. We're going to apply this in a broader sense. In other words, new employment sector skill adjustments, being the amount of time required to adapt to new emerging employment sectors, would need to be on pace with applied technological advancement itself. For example, today, 95% of America uh, works in the service industry. <coughs> Excuse me, it works in the service industry, often now in front of computers. People had to learn to do this, right? Being computer literate is almost a prerequisite for everything we do now. So there is a learning process, and that takes time. Loosely speaking, this adjustment period would need to increase at the same rate as technological change. There's no evidence this is happening. Technological process is leaving the human labor market behind. I believe that the reason new emerging sectors have consistently come about to save the human labor market as each sector gets replaced by machine is because the rate of change in technology was not that dramatic at that point in time. It hadn't sped up as fast as it is now. The human mind and body, which hasn't really evolved that much in thousands of years, now has to compete with its own creation. Mechanization is leaving us behind. In other words, we cannot adapt to the speed of applied mechanization. However, that's only one side of the coin. The costs of computer technology, which is the backbone of mechanization, is now becoming exponentially cheaper as well. The first mass-produced calculators were about $100 in 1949. That's $736 adjusted for inflation today. A new digital pocket calculator can now be obtained for a dollar or less, if not free. Here is a chart done by Ray Kurzweil, who does brilliant research in uh, technological trend analysis regarding the evolution of computer power and cost based on millions of instructions per second. In 1990, we had one million instructions per second for $1,000. Ten years later, it was a thousand million for a thousand dollars. Ten years later, it was a million million. And by 2020, it will be a billion million for the cost of a thousand dollars. If we apply this pattern to technology as a whole, and by the way, again, this is, this is speculative, 
But we do see most everything reducing in cost based on the efficiency of production. And if we apply this pattern,